This is Software Engineering Radio, the podcast for professional developers on the web at se-radio.net. SE Radio is brought to you by the IEEE Computer Society and by IEEE Software Magazine. Online at computer.org slash software. For Software Engineering Radio, this is Robert Blumen. I have with me today Bernd Rucker. Bernd has been involved in software development for over 15 years with a focus on automating core workflows for enterprises, including T-Mobile and Lufthansa. He's contributed to open source workflow engines and is the author of a book on business process modeling, which is now in its fifth edition and is available in English, German, and Spanish. He regularly speaks at conferences and has many slide decks and articles on workflow management on SlideShare and uh, on the internet. Baron, welcome to Software Engineering Radio. Hi. <laughs> Uh, I'm really pleased to have you today because we're going to be talking about orchestrating microservices with workflow. It's a topic uh, of great interest to me, and I'm really pleased to see that you've done so much in that area. As I said, we will be talking about orchestrating microservices with workflow. I want to start out with the building blocks of that topic. Please give us a brief overview of microservices. Listeners can also go back and listen to show 213 on microservices for more about that topic. So from my perspective, there are uh, the most important thing about microservices is basically that you slice down functionality or, or capabilities of the software into smaller pieces. And that, I mean, technology-wide, that can result in like different things. Nowadays, it might be microservices, or if you go serverless, it might be functions, or it might be bigger. But the core thing is that you slice it down into relatively autonomous and isolated parts. And if you do this, um, then you start getting a lot of like new challenges. You probably solve a lot of challenges because you know, can scale up your development, the, the single services get easier to do, but you, you get a lot of new challenges um, when the microservices have to collaborate, to communicate with each other, to solve, let's say, like the bigger problems you, your company might want to solve towards your customer. We will be talking a lot about how microservices work together. I want to go on to another building block for this discussion, business process. What is a business process? You probably also want to call it a business capability. So normally your, your company offers some kind of service towards the customer. These are the most prominent business capabilities you normally have. I, I have a lot of order fulfillment examples because you know, people relatively no order fulfillment from a customer perspective. So you could um, say the order fulfillment, that's one business process from you clicked on submit the order until you really have the parcel in your hands at your doorbell, basically. And um, we have a lot of these like business processes and companies going on, also like smaller ones. You probably within the order fulfillment, you might want to do payment. Payment might be an own business process going on. And yeah, that's what's basically about. So normally these kind of business processes also involve like multiple microservices in order to get going. And that's quite an interesting area to explore. I have a list from one of your articles of typical examples of business processes that are uh, amenable to workflow, order fulfillment, invoice management, billing, approval of things, stock trading, content preparation. These are the core activities that an organization does in order to fulfill its mission and make money. Is that correct? That's, that's more or less correct. We probably go into um, workflow automation like, as a, like, like a technology, workflow engines and so on and so forth later on a bit. So I think there are two kinds of, let's say, workflows. So one are these kind of like core business processes, what you just mentioned. But I also see a lot of much more technical, much more fine-grained, smaller workflows going on in companies just for, for making relatively small things. So um, as an example, um, if you really dive very deep in technology, we have now architectures, for example, using messaging like RabbitMQ, for example. And then if you, if you consume a message, want to do some business logic, send a response message and probably send like fan out another additional messages like events then this is also already a small workflow we tackle with workflow engines nowadays as well. So that's a quite, quite huge span of use cases I see for workflow. And these kind of like 
business processes, I, I see them like the really strategic business process is one of them. You're talking about different scales, the largest scale being the mission of the organization and mm -hmm. small scales being very small patterns that could occur all over the place mm -hmm. in the fulfillment of some larger objective. Correct. I want to come back to that scale issue. Let's do one more building block here. The idea of workflow management software. We did show 198 on workflow management and 223 on activity, which is an open source business process management software. Give us a brief review of what does the workflow management system do? So the core, in its core, these kind of um, um, systems are basically state machines. So they can, you can run instances, uh, it's normally called, of workflow. So you, you create kind of a blueprint of a workflow and then you can create instances. And the workflow engine keeps track that you run through the, the blueprint, through the model in the, in the predefined order you want to have it. And it can also persist the current state whenever you wait for something. That's why it's a state machine, basically. And that's the core of these kind of workflow um, engines. And then you have a normally like an ecosystem of tools around that, because for example, you have the mod modeling capabilities. You probably want to want to have graphical models for these kind of blueprints. Um, you have operating capabilities, like you can look into the engine, what's currently going on. Is something stuck? Where is it stuck? What's the problem? What's the data attached? How can I fix that? Uh, you probably have a lot of like analysis things um, in order to look into all the audit data these kind of engines can write. So what were typical path in the in the past? Did they take long? Where do we have bottlenecks or, or room for improvements and and so on and so forth? So um, there's there's quite some ecosystem around and these kind of core engines. And that's what I would um, define as a workflow management tool. If I place a stock trade, if it was using workflow management, then my trade would be an instance of that workflow and some of the events would be the orders fulfilled, tickets generated. Exactly. For example, yes, that, that's a good view. Okay. Now, when we talked about workflow in these other shows, we were not specifically talking about microservices. We were talking about a workflow could invoke a series of steps and those steps would be other software that exists in the organization. It does seem like a natural fit now that the microservices that the workflow engine is using microservices to carry out the steps in the process. Is, is that how these two pieces fit together? There are slight differences nowadays, and I think they're really important. So if you look back at, um, at what was called like BPM and SOA, like, like five years back or something like that, then this was the typical view. You have like a, like a business process and that orchestrates other services in order to, to, to get that business process implemented. And one of the problems we got from this kind of view is that normally you got relatively big business processes, very often tackling a lot of different domains, different services, and, and, and probably also having different capabilities in them. And that very often made it hard to see the the right ownership in the organization. So who really owns these kind of business process models? Um, which team does the deployment? Which team does the running um, the kind of uh, like workflow management tools and so on and so forth? So with microservices, the perspective very much focuses on the um, ownership, on the capability of one service. So we say, for example, we have like the payment microservice. And if we have the payment microservices, a microservice, that internally might require a workflow because it does stateful things. And then I would see like the workflow engine, for example, or also the workflow model as kind of an implementation detail of that payment service and not anything sitting outside of it. And, and that means if you, if you go further, if you then look at the order fulfillment uh, microservice, that might also have some kind of workflow included, for example, to do like, um, the overall sequence of step, like pay first, then fetch the goods, then ship the goods, or so on and so forth. But only these kind of issues, not any details of payment, because that's part of the payment microservice. And that's um, probably just slightly a different view, but it's a different view than what we tried to do with BPM and SOA. I, I hope that got somehow clear what I mean. I have a bit of an advantage because I've been 
reading some of your articles to prepare for this show. What I believe you're talking about is what I might call a federated model where we have order processing as the top level objective and it would contain payment as a step. And what you're saying is payment itself may then be a small workflow within a larger workflow. Basically, yes, but the important detail, if you look at it from a microservice perspective, is that like order doesn't know that there is a workflow in payment. It shouldn't. It doesn't have to. There's a clear API between or a clear API in front of payment, basically, that is leveraged from the order fulfillment. And that this is a workflow, it's an implementation detail in that sense. So the top level workflow, it sees payment as service it doesn't know how it's implemented it's an api or a gateway it could be a service that goes out and does something and comes back synchronously stateless or it could have a small workflow embedded within it and at these boundaries of scale it doesn't need to know it's dealing with a workflow correct correct okay this does seem a natural point although i plan to talk about this later but you have advocated an architecture in which a subsystem consists of a microservice and a workflow to run only that microservice. Could you go into what you mean there and how that works? So there, I would say there is like the view of the pure microservice um, paradigm. And then um, you give all the microservice teams normally a higher autonomy and uh, they can basically choose the tools they want to. So you, you don't try to not force them into a, a certain tooling. And that means in that sense, they can pick the tool they want to. And if they have a, basically a, a problem with where they need a state machine, a workflow engine, then it's normally a natural fit that they use a workflow engine, but they can use whatever tool they like. I mean, um, that's a decision they they could make on its own. And that means like if you have different microservices, different teams, they might use also different tools. Um, some of them might use a workflow engine, others not, and probably even different tools. That's like the theoretical view of a microservice perspective. What I see in companies doing actually is that they normally try to harmonize these kind of tools. So they, they're not really eager that every team uses a different tool because that gets quite, quite unhandy. So then sometimes they start having like probably even one central, but sometimes even like a couple of workflow engines which are reused by different services. So that's technically that's no problem. From my perspective, then it, it keeps to be important that these workflow models um, are really owned by the different microservices. If they then meet on, on, on the same um, workflow engine, technically, I mean, that's doable. That's, uh, that depends on what you want to achieve, actually. Okay. What I'm thinking of is, let's take an example. We have a microservice payment service. It talks to the payment gateway and attempts to create a charge. You have a architecture pattern where you pair that microservice up with a small workflow management that would handle things like retry, failure, card expired. So the workflow and the service together constitute a larger entity, which we'll call it the um, augmented service, or I don't know if you have a name for that. So I do totally agree, uh, but I do also don't have a name for it. It depends a bit on, the, I try to tune at what the customer uses for a name for this, but basically that's the service. I mean, the service is normally made up of a couple of technical components. So for example, if you need a database, that's normally also part of like logically of the service. So um, the workflow engine, I also see that as part of the service. Why would I pair up this simple payment service with its own workflow manager? And what does the augmented service do that's better than this plain payment service by itself? It's normally all about state handling. That's what I what I said. The workflow engine is a state machine, so it can persist state for um, however long you want to. And that means if you have problems around state, um, a workflow engine can help you there. And there are actually a lot of problems, especially also already in like simple communication in distributed systems that involve state handling. I give you a couple of examples probably. So the first one is very easy which normally people know retrying. 
So if you want to have, for example, you call a REST API, you have to take care if this is not available, then you probably retry. That's something um, which is very often also handled in, for example, service meshes nowadays, which can do retry. But what they do is like they do an instant retry immediately, basically. And this is very often, uh, this is not, not sufficient. So there we have a lot of situations where you have to wait for a service to become available again in like minutes or sometimes even hours. And in this case, um, you probably want to have something like a stateful retry where you say, okay, I do the retry, but I wait for five minutes or two hours. Or if, for example, take insurances, at least here in Europe, a lot of them are still uh, running on, on, on the host. The host is in batch mode overnight. So you have to wait for the host to become available to do the retry and these kind of things. This already involves state. Another very prominent example is when you, um, when you want to call multiple remote services like in a row. So let's assume you call two or three REST services in, in, in a sequence and the third service fails. So you call it, but it gives you back, for example, a business error. And in this case, you don't have asset transactions, what we know from databases earlier on. So we cannot simply say, roll it back, but we, we probably have have an error where we say, oh, we have to undo the other steps we already called successfully. And this is also something a workflow engine can handle that's very often called compensation or it's also known as the uh, saga pattern. It basically means that you, you have to remember what you already called and then you have to undo that correctly. And that involves state because like, I mean, it's a distributed system, so you might have to wait again or it takes longer and this is why a lot of these kind of problems are stateful and um, that's basically the added value the workflow engine can give you um, in its core very often then there are additional things like visibility or, or operation things but in its core it's normally always about state handling at the beginning of the show and i don't think we quite finished this so i want to come back motivating why there is a need for microservices to work together with workflow. In your writing, you talk about two models for this, one being choreography and the other orchestration. Explain those two models. Okay, so I start with choreography actually. So the, the idea behind choreography is that you don't have like a central conductor, that's orchestration, but um, you, you just have different services who collaborate by just collaborating with each other without somebody steering that. And that means like if we do an example, again, I do order fulfillment. So if you think of an, for example, a checkout component like a web shop, for example, that could be one microservice. And this microservice could, for example, then like either doing a direct call towards like one other service where it says, okay, there was an order placed, or probably if you're event driven, it, uh, and that's actually the most famous uh, approach at the moment, then you probably just emit an event and say, uh, okay, there was an order placed. And then some other component listens to that event and says, hey, there was an order placed, so I have to do something. For example, I have to collect the payment. And when the payment is collected, you probably emit another event um, that the payment was received or collected and then another service just starts working and that's a choreography because you just like having a lot of these like peer-to-peer -peer collaborations um, uh, either event driven or probably also like like rpc or, or rest ish driven and that's normally named choreography and that's got very famous recently um, with microservices there's a, a the famous article by Martin Fowler, for example, and he also uh, wrote something like that this is the more favorable approach for microservices than an orchestration approach. And in the contrast, the orchestration means that there is some conductor, some control, which basically tells other services what to do. So um, let's, if we keep on in the order fulfillment example, there might be like an order fulfillment process, a workflow, for example, that tells other services, hey, retrieve the payment now. And uh, oh, the payment was retrieved. So the next service should probably prepare the goods and so on and so forth. So there's some control in that. And that's normally um, named orchestration. Why are you more of an advocate of orchestration and choreography? And what are use cases where it is superior? So there Currently, I'm advocating orchestration a lot, basically because 
I see a lot of tendency towards choreography. And there are good use cases for choreography. I can come back to that in a second. Um, but there are also quite a lot of risks with choreography, um, which is basically that you really lose sight of what's going on in the architecture. So if all the services are playing ping pong with, with each other, it's really hard, hard to understand how the overall end-to-end -end flow through that system really works. And there was also an article by Martin Fowler writing about that risk like beginning of last year. So projects start to realize that. And because I see that risk, like for a lot of companies, they really go down that route and, and, and really realize that risk. That's why I'm advocating basically the orchestration approach a lot, because I think people should be aware of that there is that risk with choreography and that it can, in a lot of use cases, also orchestration is a good fit. And if you look in the essence of the two approaches, and that's actually very interesting, that it's basically the, the let's say the only difference is the direction kind of, um, of coupling very often. So if you look at the event-driven coupling, um, then it's normally like the receiver decides that he's interested in certain events. And if you look at orchestration, normally the sender decides that he wants somebody else to do something. So the, the coupling is in the sender. And for a lot of like use cases you see out there, um, for a lot of scenarios, it's very natural which one is fitting best, better for the situation at hand. If we take the order fulfillment, it's very natural that there should be an order fulfillment orchestration that tells the payment to retrieve the payment um, because that's like the ownership or of that capabilities in the order fulfillment. And otherwise payment um, would have to know about orders and about a lot of like information about the order flow, which is quite unnatural actually and quite hard to manage, I think. You're saying is with choreography there are little bits and chunks of the order process that are distributed among each of the different services. For example, shipment has to know that it's only able to ship after payment has taken place. With orchestration, you've moved the knowledge of the business process into this one entity which does the orchestration, which is the workflow management system. Is that right? Almost, I would, I would say I move that logic into the, uh, if I'm in microservice, into the order fulfillment microservice. And that might use leverage the workflow um, model for doing that. But the core idea is that capability of orchestrating the other services, um, I really move that logic into the um, order fulfillment microservice. Yes. Orchestration, then, it's a separation of concerns and workflow management is a way that you can implement orchestration. Correct. Correct. And that's actually, that's an uh, interesting detail or an important detail, I think, because you can implement orchestration without a workflow engine. So if you can do that hard coded in the order fulfillment, if you like, um, that's already or orchestration. So it's not about any, any kind of, let's say, workflow engines where even a lot of people think about some centralized huge engines, um, which is not true. I mean, it's, it's, it's simply that the order fulfillment says, hey, payment, do that for me. If you're done, I do the next thing. That's orchestration. If we're still talking about choreography versus orchestration, you could have a stateless service. Some people call this a God service in which requests come in. It decides what services in the ecosystem to call in what order some of them fail and succeed, and then it bundles up the result. That's not a workflow management system. It is doing orchestration. Would that be an example of a non-workflow management orchestration? That could be an example of the, uh, yeah, right. I would actually love to comment on the God service because that's, I'm uh, discussing that a lot, actually. Um, that was, Sam Newman has written about that in his book that you have the risk of getting a God service when you use um, orchestration. And the thing, what I see is that they, a lot of people, when they say, okay, we do orchestration, they think of relatively monolithic orchestration flows, let's say. So if you're doing like the order fulfillment and within the order fulfillment, you start doing a lot of things which are naturally in the domain of payment then you start doing a lot of things in order fulfillment, which you shouldn't. And this 
And, and that's the second part of the sentence, what Sam Newman writes in his book. You get the God service and um, basically stupid CRUD services. And this is just a matter of doing good APIs for your services. So if the payment service, for example, has a proper API, it would mean the API is probably something like retrieve payment. And then you get back either we got it or we couldn't get it and we will not get it. So this is the API. And if that's the API, and you cannot make the order fulfillment a God service because, I mean, the logic is in the payment service hidden behind the API. So I think that has no direct connection to, to orchestration. But very often, because then you probably have the, the workflow management tool within the order fulfillment service, and probably you have the capabilities of doing that very easy. Some projects, especially in the past with BPM and SOA, managed to move a lot of logic into these workflows, and that made it a God service, and that was a bad idea, actually. We're, we've been talking about the choreography versus orchestration and that orchestration doesn't necessarily require a workflow management system. What are the characteristics of the use cases where you would want to use a workflow management system to do orchestration? So the, um, we already talked about the state handling that the, uh, the workflow engine is a state machine. So whenever it's state full, you probably want to leverage a workflow engine. And that's, by the way, because we're in distributed systems, that starts to be almost everywhere. Because, I mean, every remote call might not be doable at that moment in time because the network might not be there, might be broken or whatever. Or if you're using asynchronous communication, you might have to wait for the response. So these kind of problems start to be everywhere. So that's the main motivation very often. But I mean, what I said early on, there are other drivers. So one uh, big driver is visibility. So um, whenever you do that orchestration flow in, in, in such workflow tools, you normally get a proper visualization. And most of the tools, so ours included, but also most of the others use now um, something called BPMN. Uh, that's an ISO standard. That's where we wrote the book about. And that's, very, that's a very powerful language on the one hand. And on the other hand, it's really easy to understand, easy to read, even from non-technical people, even from like operations people, which might not be developers, even if they have a technical background. So a lot of people can really understand these kind of models. And that drives it towards, um, I call that biz DevOps. So basically, it's about business to development collaboration, but also like DevOps, like the operations part. And that's really powerful. And that's very often a motivation on its own. BPMN, which stands for Business Process Modeling Notation, that's a type of a language for defining these workflows. Is that right? Correct. So um, BPMN is, uh, for most, it's basically an XML file and a language definition. So you can define uh, like sequences, doing stuff in parallel, um, doing like splits where you decide where you want to go, um, but also like very mature advanced concepts like timers or timeouts you can define or you can um, also model like events. So you can have something like, like incoming events or messages and, and decide what you want to do about it. Um, but also what I mentioned earlier about compensation, for example, these undo activities, all of these kind of things are built into the language. So it's very easy to express this kind of problem. And on top of that language, you always have the graphical format, which is also defined. Would it be fair to say that BPMN is a domain-specific language for defining workflows? Yeah, I think that's, that's a good description, yeah. Then a workflow becomes a type of computer program that the workflow management system will execute. Correct. And, and probably one thing to note, because a lot of people normally ask this, so what, what we, for example, do, and I think most of the other engines do that as well, so the BPMN file is an XML file. So that's for me, that's source code. So you can also put that into your Git and, and into your project structure and version it there. And we interpret this during runtime. So we don't do any like code generation step on top of that. So the XML file is executed directly, basically. This book you and I were discussing offline, which I'll link to in the show notes, they talk about in workflow that the process becomes a first class entity, which is this XML program. If you compare that to choreography, the process does not exist as a single entity. 
in any one piece of code. Could you talk about the, the importance of that distinction? Yeah, so I think the, the, the main point here is, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I go with the wording of being like the core entity there, um, especially if you're into microservices that like the view is a bit different. I see it as one artifact within one microservice. But anyhow, I think having that model available at one place is, um, is powerful in many ways. So the first is your, I mean, it's working code. So it's, uh, it's one, basically one point where you can look at how it's currently really implemented. So normally, if we see systems which are, don't use orchestration, and I see them a lot recently, the first question is like, okay, how does this workflow, like the business process works end to end? And this normally takes a workshop of probably even days in order to figure that out and to really figure it out how it works. So there's a lot of diving into code, into probably distributed tracing, into logging, into whatever it is in order to figure out how it works. And in the orchestration approach, you have like, you can look at that model and it's, it's, it's running. So you know it's reality and that's um, really powerful. And you even get like additional information like, like audit data. And I think that's, the, the, that's so important because then you have also one place where you can change logic or we where you can discuss about changes of logic. And um, what we see, I mean, in, in the past, I, I had a lot of discussions where, where people or architects said, okay, but these business processes we do, they're relatively static. They don't change that often. And I'm, I don't think that is so true at, uh, at um, all occasions I see, because we, we have a lot of, yeah, let's say, necessity for, for agility nowadays. So um, even processes are not that stable anymore. And then it's important to know how they are implemented at the moment in order to change anything. What you're talking about is when you have one piece of code that executes the business process, you know where to go to change it. Correct. You can see what it is. You don't have to piece together multiple event handlers from multiple different services. And if you want to make a change, it's straightforward, more straightforward to make it. Exactly, exactly. And it's um, sometimes even, so the first thing is, you know, the place where you can change it, but also in terms of deploying the new version, it gets much easier. So let's assume you want to want to change these order fulfillment process, for example, and you want to do probably uh, fetching the goods from stock before you wait for the payment because you want to be fast or you want to do in a parallel or whatever it is and if you want to make these changes you have like one service where you can go and there you look at the orchestration basically and you can change the flow and then if you use a workflow engine these tools can um, also version the flow so if you have running order fulfillments in your system which you normally have then you can say okay these keep going in the old version and probably new instances are started in new versions. If you compare that to the, the choreographed approach where you have multiple services knowing what they have to do and whenever a certain event happens, in order to make such changes, you probably have to adjust a couple of these services, redeploy them probably even at the same time or at least think about the timing of the deployments and also then keeping track of the different versions of flows that are currently going around in your system is really, really hard, actually. I want to move on now more and talk about some of the tools in depth. You're involved in at least one, one or more open source workflow management systems. What are the projects you personally are involved with? So I'm, I, I have quite some history in workflow engines, actually. So personally, I started... I'm contributing to JBoss JBPM like 12 or 13 years ago. Then I was also part of the activity team. You mentioned activity um, earlier on. And what we do as a company, we productized um, the Kamunda engine, which is basically a fork of the activity engine. So that's um, where I'm involved with uh, at most at the moment. So that's the um, Kamunda BPM open source platform. And within Kamunda, what we also do in parallel at the moment we started developing a new workflow engine totally from scratch. It's called CB. It's on cb.io. It's also open source. And what we do there is that we really uh, like re-architect the whole engine architecture for basically two reasons. So um, whenever you want to go really in high throughput, highly scalable environments, 
let's say the traditional engine architectures, which are normally based on relational databases for persistence, are um, not scaling enough. And secondly, also like cloud native architectures, for, for example, if you want to run your own Kubernetes cluster, people are not really happy if they have to run a relational database in there because it's not easy to do. And that's motivated us to do something like CV. But the, um, probably I should have started with that one first, but the traditional engine architectures, and that's actually true for most engines, also the Kamunda engine, they are basically um, the workflow engine and underneath there's a relational database where we basically just keep the state uh, safe, persistent. Let's talk some more about ZB. Uh, it sounds like an interesting architecture. What kind of throughput can prior systems handle and what are you aiming for with ZB? Firstly, the, the numbers are always a problem. So um, the numbers are really um, depending on a lot of factors, what you do in the workflows, on, on what kind of um, like, even like hardware or, or software you're running. Um, what we see at most customer scenarios is that the most of the time and the resources like, like, like memory or CPU or whatever it is are consumed in things that are not concern of the workflow engine. So whatever you do around, like if you call a service, you probably, if you call, do a SOAP call, for example, that's more expensive than what we do in the workflow engine normally. But to give you a number, so I did a, a, like a test run um, like two or three years back, actually on my consumer notebook, so nothing fancy. And there I could do with the current Kamunda engine, I could do like instances per second, let's say in the hundreds, so a couple of hundred per second. That's what I could run there um, relatively easy. And we have big installations really maxing that out so you can optimize that. But I think it gives you like an order of magnitude what you can do there. And with CB, that's um, like we do a big jump there. So if I run on the same machine, if I run CB, then I can do roughly like 30 to 40,000 instances per second. And that's even not the end of it. So we are currently still tuning it. And um, the biggest, but then the biggest difference is that CB can really scale horizontally. So with the current engine architecture, we are basically, even if we do cluster the engine, we meet on the database. And that means the database is the limit of the scalability. And with CB, we're, CB it's an own distributed system. And that means we, and we basically store event streams on disk directly and do a couple of other things on disk. And then we replicate that to followers within their own um, network for resilience. And that really scales up um, horizontally. And that means we have uh, experiments where we run like millions of workflow instances per second. So that's um, definitely doable. And also we get the latency down to, to very small numbers, which really brings into use cases where you have these low latency, high throughput scenarios. And that's basically the um, sweet spot where we want to go with uh, CB at the moment. Can you think of any industries or problem domains where that is, uh, uh, where they see that type of, of volume? We see that volume actually in you know, all industries as soon as you um, shift the focus a bit. So currently, if you think of workflow management or business processes, very often you think about, if you go to telco, for example, you think about application processes. Hey, I want to have a new SIM card, for example. And that's relatively rare. It might be a couple of thousands per day or probably even like 100K per day if you're, you're like big, but that's it. But in the same domain, you have use cases. If what I said earlier, if I want to do stateful retrying for every REST call, for example, or if you want to run a workflow to do a couple of checks every time somebody picks up the phone in order to make a call, then this is on a complete different scaling level. Or if you go to finance, for example, there's a different thing if you open an account or, or apply for a credit card, or if you're really in like trading and want to do that like in, in real time. And you can do the same thing for basically all the industries. So we really shift the focus towards other use cases than these like relatively rare bigger business processes, and then you, you start having that scale requirement. You were talking about older generations of these systems using a relational database and ZB uses an event stream. How does ZB model the state that it saves? So how it works is basically a bit simplified, probably, but it basically works like 
you're having, we call it records, uh, it could be an event or a command. So when you, when you, via the API, for example, tell CV, please start a new workflow instance for me, then that's basically a command. We put that on the stream. And then we have command or uh, record processes internally. And that's kind of a single writer principle. So there's um, independently of how big you do the cluster, there's one thread in the whole cluster responsible for a certain workflow instance in order to process that command. And then it does that. It basically probably looks in the model what should happen. And then it creates an event like workflow instance created, or oh, uh, uh, like a sequence flow, like the arrow to the next step, sequence flow taken, then activity entered, and so on and so forth. So we, we write that as an uh, event stream. And then we have multiple of these stream processors. So one is for the core execution, for example, but we have others in order, for example, to write data to, to the audit facility, for example. So it's kind of a, probably not really, but comparable to what CQRS does. So you can have a read model for the auditing, for example, or for the operations. So we have a, a writer doing that and so on and so forth. And what we do also like additional internally in the engine we keep a model or um, basically the current state of a workflow instance we keep internally in order to do um, calculations how to go on but that's kind of an internal representation of that you did just mention cqrs we did a show on that and we talked about event sourcing where instead of storing the state you store all of the events in a particular stream, and then you can roll those up to get the current state. Are you talking about that type of model for each instance? We actually started with that. We, we changed it a, a bit in the, uh, in the meanwhile. So we're using, it's called RocksDB. So it's, it's, it's something um, Facebook also uses internally in order to keep that current state. And as soon as we process these kind of events, we try to get rid of them in the runtime engine. So we are not fully event sourced there. So we don't keep the whole record of events. We normally keep them, but externally, like in the audit facility. So we don't need them in the core runtime. The core runtime has the current state, actually. And uh, we did that for a couple of performance reasons, actually. That makes sense. Now, we're talking about applications that can be thousands of instances per second. There could be millions of instances in flight events are coming in from these other collaborations how does zb dispatch an event to the correct instance and ensure that that instance can handle it yeah so basically we have um, something called a, called a gateway and the gateway knows the cluster state basically and there are some i actually don't want to go in all the details because there are some really clever things in there it's open source, so if you fancy it, you can go into all the source code. But basically, that gateway knows, for example, where basically to send certain messages to in order to correlate to the right instance. And um, that's handled more or less under the hood there. Also, we have a couple of algorithms how to, to distribute load. So we have, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Kafka or the listeners are familiar with Kafka. So we have couple of things that are inspired also by Kafka. So Kafka has this concept of partitions in order to scale. So that means like for one partition, and that's the same thing for us, there's always like only one stream processor running. So that doesn't really scale. So that in our case, it means there's always one thread running for one partition. And that means we have to have multiple partitions in order to scale. And these multiple partitions then can be distributed across different machines actually, and then it, it really means that you scale out. And there is some logic involved in order to find the right partition for, for like creating a new workflow or even like sending messages to the right workflows. But I don't want to go too much in depth in there. And the rest is basically, if you're familiar again with Kafka, they do something or Zookeeper does that. But we also do like leaders and followers, but that's for um, resilience. So we, uh, we, we distribute or we replicate the state of one broker to other brokers in order to not, not lose any data. But in that case, you always talk to the leader. We've also been talking about retries and a retry might not occur a second later. It might occur hours later during business hours, or you may wait a day. You also might have a time limit that expires where a 
process has to complete in a certain time or you give up. Is there a scheduler embedded in ZB that can handle things that have to happen at a certain time? Yeah, definitely. So short answer is yes. <laughs> Could you say more about that? So not really much at the moment. So we're currently um, with CB, we're in a, in a um, let's say, R&D uh, state. So we're currently targeting production-ready release end of the year, but we're not yet there. And we're currently um, building a couple of these concepts around the schedule. So that might change until we have that recording from today online. So I don't want to go into too much detail in there. Okay. I'm going to ask you a different question. Could you talk generally about the responsibilities in the design of a scheduler within a workflow management system, drawing upon your experience in that domain? So scheduling, I mean, it's an important part of these kind of workflow engines. So there, there are different aspects of that. So normally there are moments when the workflow engine has to get active on its own, which is the most prominent use case being timer. So you say, okay, there's a certain timeout, or you ha in some processes, you want to wait for a certain time until you move on. And that means there must be some kind of scheduler who um, basically picks up the instances at the right moment in time. And this has to be done like in a, in a large scale, it still has to be a, in a very performant way. And for example, in the current Camunda engine, we invested a lot of effort in, in prioritizing certain things so um, that you, for example, make sure um, if you have like low latency requirements for certain workflows that they are processed before others. Like if you have like an, like an application workflow, which runs for a couple of days, then normally uh, delaying that by a few minutes doesn't matter much. Whereas if you have like an almost real time requirement, it matters a lot. So um, there are a couple of things to do right there with this kind of scheduling. So it's not, not totally easy. Could you address the issue of, maybe I'll call this transactionality in that we want at the end of the process, all the steps to have been done. And we probably want most of these steps to be done once. We don't want to pay twice or ship the product twice, but you can be dealing with external systems or you're generally not in an environment where you can get a database transaction how does the workflow management ensure that things are done the correct number of times? So I would differentiate the two tool stacks we currently have. If I look at workflow engines like the Camunda um, BPM product, that's basically it's a, written in Java and you can integrate that within your Java transaction management if you like. So there we have quite a number of customers actually who basically leverage real asset transaction which combine the, the workflow engine and some business logic on the database. It only works if you're on the same database. I mean, otherwise you get XA transactions and um, this normally doesn't really work. So it's possible, but I wouldn't, wouldn't take it as a default case. In all other cases, and that's um, for CB or if we do remote calls, REST or SOAP or, or GRPC or whatever it is, then you don't have these asset transactions. And in this case, I mean, I, in most of my talks currently, I have really a lot of slides on item potency because I think item potency is one of the most important concepts every developer should be aware of. So item potency means that I can call a service twice and that's not a problem. So it, it either doesn't matter or the service can detect that this is a duplicate and just ignores the duplicate call. And in, in these kind of architectures, basically in every distributed system, you should do services that are item potent. That's really hard if you don't have item potent services. And that means if you, if you leverage the workflow engine, for example, in order to call other services, you normally do it in a way that you say, okay, if I, if I can't commit my local transaction, for example, then I might retry that thing. I might call it twice. That's hard to avoid because um, there are, uh, can make a couple of drawings and, and basically prove that it's, you can always have moments where you have no idea if you called the other service or not. So there is not a really good way around of retrying. So that's what also happens in there. Um, and that's what you should plan for. On the other side of the equation, like if um, some service calls the workflow engine, for example, in CB we have 
Um, and also in Carbona BPM, we have prepared it in a way that you can have item potent start, for example, of a workflow instance. So whenever you call that and you call it twice, it doesn't matter. So we recognize we already started that workflow instance. So we are item potent as well. And I think if you do that right, um, then things start to, to play out relatively nicely. The other thing about consistency there um, is what I mentioned earlier. Like if you have a couple of things like two or three steps in a sequence, the third fails, you cannot roll back, then you use this undo functionality like built in the BPMN language. You talk a bit more about the undo functionality and give an example of when that would be used. I normally use the, let's say, the classical example. So whenever you're looking, um, like if you, if you search on Google for Saga pattern, you always find the same example. So I also um, want to use that today, which is a trip booking. So you want to book a trip. And then the first thing you might um, want to book is the, um, like the hotel, then a rental car, and then a flight. And then it might be that the flight cannot be booked for whatever reason. You get an error there. But you already booked a hotel and a car. And that means you have to make sure you cancel the car and the hotel. And if you do that in BPMN, in these workflow models, it means that for every activity like book the hotel, you can define directly the activity which does the undo, like cancel the hotel, for example. And then the workflow engine keeps track of which activities were executed already and make sure they are compensated correctly. And that's done under the hood and, and, and stateful and reliable. And that's basically this kind of undo functionalities there. I don't know if I would do it in this order, but suppose I did the car first, the hotel and flights, which are the most variable. I'm not able to book the flight. Now I need to undo the car and the hotel because I don't need them anymore. And that's, that's the responsibility of the undo phase. Correct. Correct. And that's, um, again, by the way, you could do the same thing um, with choreography. So I also had that example with choreography. But there, you also see that it's really hard to keep track how the how the undo phase is doing. And um, if you do it with BPMN, it's obviously orchestration. So you have like one workflow model where you exactly the okay, this is the first. Uh, these are the steps, and these are the undo things you have to do. And one thing which is also interesting um, to look at. So the saga patterns. You you already mentioned that. So Normally, you also order the activities by, let's say, by risk or by cost. So it's not a surprise that I do the hotel first because it's normally cheap to cancel or, or um, for free to cancel. I would have thought I would do the flight first because that's the most risky thing and you want to get that out of the way because I don't need the hotel or the car if I can't get the flight. Am I thinking about this the wrong way? I think in this example, I would do it the other way around, because if for whatever reason you cannot do the car or the hotel, like canceling the flight is really expensive. Yeah. And the other way around, it's normally relatively cheap. But there are other situations where, where this kind of thinking is pretty much valid. So um, the important thing is that it matters in which um, order you do that, which, for example, for asset transaction, if you really can roll back, it doesn't. But in this case, it does because you have like intermediary states which are really committed. Um, so um, you really have to think about the order. I think that's the important message. Okay, I'm going to change the subject a bit now. I'm talking about monitoring and observability. You did touch on this a little while ago, and we also talked about having a process defined as a piece of code or a first class entity where now it may be easier to observe or visualize the process. What kind of uh, opportunities for visual understanding do these workflow engines give? And you could pick one of them that you work on or speak in general. So I, I always can comment best on the tools I know, which are basically the tools we do. So there are multiple ways, first of all, to define this kind of workflow. So for us, we can either do that in code. So you could define a workflow in, in Java code, for example, there we also have kind of a DSL, like a fluent programming thing. And then we generate the XML and the graphical um, visualization out of that, or you start with the visual. I normally... When I um, discuss with people which are new to workflow management, I very often, if they are developers, I very often start with the Java DSL, actually, because it shows that there's no hidden 
complexity, no magic in these kind of graphical models, because a lot of developers are often afraid of graphical models, which I think is because of a lot of things which were going around with MDA and so on. But whenever it starts to be more complex, people are naturally using the graphical model. It's much easier to understand to do. And then you have this model independently of if you did it in code or graphics, but having the graphical model for all the later on phases, like looking into it when you're running the stuff or in operations, for example, then you exactly see, okay, I have a problem at this point, And this is how I did get there. You see exactly which steps were executed at what time, what's the, the data attached and so on and so forth. So you see a lot of, lot of context information for that. So that I think is, is, is really valuable there. And also like the audit data, like we have a tool called Optimize there. We can load, like push all the data from probably even different engines in there. And then it can make a lot of analysis on that. Like um, heat maps, they are very, very um, popular. So you can see like what are the most frequent paths or you can make like duration heat maps. So where it's typically really slow or we can define SLAs and see where it's slower than the SLA. and these kind of things. So um, there's a lot of things you can do with it. We, uh, for example, we also have like a small community extension, which was actually um, contributed by a couple of people from the community where and we also leverage the BPMN model for test coverage. So you see for every test case, like a JUnit test case, for example, you write, you see the exact path which was taken. So if that test case fails for whatever reason, you can directly, for example, in Jenkins, like jump to the visual and see, okay, it's executed till that step. And that's where the test case crashed. And that makes it very often easier to understand what's going on because very often that happens like a year after you wrote the initial code or so. so. If I could summarize your answer, you're talking about the definition phase where you are creating the workflow and then moving on to operations where it's running and you could use the same visual representation, but you could be looking at how much activity is going on in each phase of your workflow. And then audit, which you mentioned a couple of times, I, maybe we could come back to that. So by audit, Data, you mean that the system uh, generates some kind of either log or structured records describing what it's been doing, and then you can take that and do further analytics or monitoring on top of that? Correct. So we also call that history data. So basically, what the engine writes is which steps were executed at what time and um, what workflow instances were executed and so on and so forth. And this can be either used for like really looking into the history of one instance, either because it's faulty or probably even for a compliance reason. So you want to want to know why this workflow instance ended up in the whatever rejected phase or something like that. But you can also do a lot of like really analysis on, on, on top of that to understand if the workflow is really yeah, behaving in the way it should or if it's optimal or if there's like potential to improve that. I could see that being very useful in the case you're talking about on an individual case, what went wrong with this order? Why didn't we ship it? But also in a statistical sense, learning about we as a company, how good a job are we doing at fulfilling orders? What percentage of the time do we have to retry the charge? And all these other ways you can understand the performance of your business in carrying out its objectives. Correct. And we we also have like, a lot of fun stories we see like in a couple of projects it happened that after a workflow went to production after a while we, we looked at these kind of data and we saw that certain paths which were like really really important during implementation because that's an exceptional case we have to cover and there were a lot of effort in development going into this special part and it was never executed and that happens really often and um, then these tools give you a proof look, this was never executed in the last, in the past six months. Do we really have to maintain that code? Can we throw it away? And, and, and that, this is real evidence. I mean, that's data you can use in order to make an argument. One question I'd like to wrap up with here. If we in IT, we'd like to adopt a new programming language or a new type of app server, the business side may not care as long as the uh, SLAs are met. When you're changing from uh, 
either ad hoc or choreography to adopting workflow management system. Is that something that business is inherently involved in that process? So we have different approaches for different customers. So the good thing is that with these business processes and for especially BPMN and the visibility is that you can always involve business because they, they start understanding the visuals and they are normally really impressed by this kind of data they get and heat maps they get. And so, for example, if you're in choreography, what we sometimes do as a first step is just to attach like the workflow engine and then have kind of a tracking process. It doesn't control anything. It doesn't do anything like actively, but it, it correlates all the events on, on, on a bus, for example, and then you start seeing these kind of instances and you start collecting this kind of data and probably even attach like a first SLA, like a timeout. If we don't up, end up to this point within a certain time frame, we should do something. And that's always easy to involve business with these kind of things. And I think that's a big opportunity also to, to get business and IT closer together there. Great. I said that was going to be my last question, but that does make me think about you have We've talked about these timers, you could have a condition where we've charged the customer, we agree to ship product within one day after charging, and now it's gone to the second day, we haven't shipped. Within these processes, would this be a like a business level exception? Or how does this type of case where we ha- we're not doing the process correctly from a business standpoint to uphold obligations to the, the customer? How does that fit into the the modeling or the execution and and who who gets does somebody get paged or what happens when we've when these cases occur? So there are um, two levels what you could do. So the first is like a, let's say the technical level, so that's more like the um, paging level for what we do, for example, with optimize where you can define SLAs on certain things and then you say, okay, this, task must be executed within a certain time frame, for example. And if this doesn't happen, then this is kind of a violation of the SLA. And this would be more or less something which probably triggers a pager. The second level is um, you can really uh, make it part of the business workflow, uh, the business process. So um, let's say you have that order fulfillment process and then BPMN as a language supports that you say, okay, there's a certain phase, for example, within that. And if that takes longer than a certain time frame, then I want to do something. In this case, you really model what you want to do. It could be that you, whatever, um, um, put that in the human task management that somebody looks at it, or it could be that you apologize to the to the customer, or it could be that you cancel the order because it took too long. And that's, I mean, that's a business decision. So um, that really be, belongs there. Great. Well, that pretty much comes to the end of our time. Bernd, is there anything else you wanted to add that we haven't covered? I think there's a lot we haven't covered, but I think that was a hopefully good overview. So I'm fine with what we spoke about today. And I think there's a lot of material like in the blog posts and in other talks um, online. If, if I got people interested in that, they probably want to read it up there. Where's the best place for people to go to find your work? So the, the easiest would be probably, I have a homepage, it's berndrücke.io, you probably have it in the notes. And there I link at least all my talks and my blog is linked. And that's probably a good starting point. If you don't find your way through, another approach would also to, to send me an email, to ping me on Twitter or whatever works for you. And then we can probably also discuss or I can send you a couple of links. Link to everything and we'll link to the open source project. Bernd, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you for appearing on Software Engineering Radio. Thank you. For Software Engineering Radio, this has been Robert Blumen. And thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to SE Radio, an educational program brought to you by IEEE Software Magazine. For more about the podcast, including other episodes, visit our website at se-radio.net. To provide feedback, you can comment on each episode on the website or reach us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or through our Slack channel at seradio.slack.com. You can also email us at team at se-radio.net. This and all other episodes of SE Radio is licensed under Creative Commons License 2.5. Thanks for listening.